All right. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to another Learning Tech Talks where we are continuing to explore, I'm just going to say all things technology, because at this point, we, we just have kind of crossed the lines of learning tech on so many fronts. But today we're taking a deeper dive on serious games and what well, we're talking game based learning. We're talking gamification. We're going to actually decrypt all these different terms that get thrown around too frequently. And to do that, I'm joined by Dan White, who's the CEO of Filament Games and fellow Wisconsinite, right? That is correct. Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So we are, although, although, as we were talking about right before we went live, you're, you're headquartered in Wisconsin, but the dynamics of the company have changed uh, quite, quite a bit over the past couple of years. That's right. Yeah. We've actually just recently crossed the tipping point where more than half of our studio staff are not in Wisconsin or not local to Madison. Really? Okay. Okay. So yeah, more than really. half of the company is not in Wisconsin, even though if you were to Google filament games, it would say Madison, Wisconsin. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. And how big is, how big is filament games now? We're just about 75 people right now. Okay. And yeah, good. Things are, we actually just right before this meeting came out of our hiring meeting where we talk about how many more people we have to hire before we have everybody that we need and we've still got a little ways to go. So I imagine okay. we'll round out the year a little bit closer. To still eight. got room to grow. Still got, well, and you were saying that things are, have been growing over since we, I mean, these things are always funny because I have the initial discussions months, months in advance of these. So it's always funny when, when we actually do the show to be like, wow, okay. It's been quite a while since we even talked. And so I'm sure things have evolved uh, even since then, which Actually, before I even get into the whole game-based learning thing, one of the things, though, that I thought was really interesting that I at least have to kind of hit on is you took a bit of an interesting direction with the whole headquarters thing, right? And I do, just because that is such a topic in the industry right now, mm -hmm. I think it is really interesting that even as a gaming company, a good chunk of your people, even in Wisconsin, you said are actually remote. So you've really kind of embraced this whole hybrid model. Absolutely. I mean, here I am in my home office. I embarrassingly am about a five minute walk from the office. <laughs> my, <laughs> my day is just so filled with meetings and actually taking meetings in an office now is worse than, than taking them at home. Before the pandemic, we used to have a pretty flexible remote work policy. And so we had a lot of hybrid meetings. And interestingly enough, the meetings where you have some people physically sitting around a conference room table and some people on the screen were the worst of all but not the, the best i still think was having a bunch of people sitting around a table but if you're going to go hybrid i think you should just go all the way to full remote in terms of making a meeting work. Okay. Yeah. okay well i know i know that some companies have kind of they've really embraced the hybrid thing where they their tech has actually supported where they have like screens where each person shoots in on an actual screen right. so even around the table it's like well you're actually talking to people versus this camera in the back of the room with a screen off in La La Land. So again, I agree. If you're going to do it, go, go all in. I think um, the technology, I, there's definitely a lot of organizations that are making investment in infrastructure for hybrid meetings. And I think it's starting to get better. I would say in another two or three years, it'll actually probably be great. And that's when we'll probably make some investments there. But yeah, at least yeah. for right now, it's still pretty awkward. It's, it still is fairly awkward. It's, it's not, you know, even you start sharing something on the screen and all of a sudden your remote participants just kind of disappear and you're like, well, okay. So, so yeah, I, I, I've, I've talked to, what's that? Oh, just, I was just going to say more to the point though. People just don't really want to go into the office. <laughs> yeah. And so it's really become one of our, one of the things that helps us recruit is being able to offer that flexibility because I feel like, you know, it's a very competitive job market right now. We'll it is a very market, competitive market, especially in tech and being able to promise a, you know, entire flexibility up to and including the ability to never have to come into an office, even if you're local to Madison is actually considered a pretty sizable perk at this point. I would say, I, yeah, and it's I, the reason I I know I know we're talking about game based learning, but the reason I brought this up is I you know as the CEO of the company, I think I, I have a lot of respect for the fact you you took a bold move in this because even we talked about the real estate 
that you did. You ended up saying, you know what, we're going to rethink, we're still going to have an office, but we're going to rethink what that office is. And even people local, you're like, hey, you know what, you might, <laughs> you live five minutes from the office and you're like, well, you know, I'll go in if I really need to. But for the most part, it's kind of at my discretion. So um, I would certainly feel yeah, very, I, very hypocritical if I required people to go in <laughs> while I sat at home. <laughs> well, I have a similar attitude sometimes with my team where I'm like, can you imagine if I had a like, you must be in Miami policy as I'm sitting in my home office from right, Milwaukee right. and going like, what are you doing at home? <laughs> I would be like, come on, give me a break. So anyway, so so let's, th this was a little bit of a sidebar, but this is a great kickoff because now let's talk a little bit about your journey into this because this isn't like, you know, you have a learning platform that kind of gamifies it. I mean, you're you're in the serious game business, but what what was that journey like for you? I mean, were you always in game design? How did you end up starting Filament Games and, and actually getting into this space? Yeah, so personally, I always believed in the power of games to do more than just entertain. I've been a gamer my entire life. I've also designed games my entire life, mostly board games. Okay. And so a lot of my- Really? Design board games? Yep. Really? That's kind of your- yeah, for fun. Most of them were terrible, but yeah, I always enjoyed you know okay. board games and treasure hunts and mostly physical space stuff because I didn't have any okay. skills at the time. But when I thought about most of my formative learning experiences, where I was like, wow, I had a fantastic learning experience. It was usually outside of school. It was usually on a field trip or a museum or honestly just something that I was doing with my own volition. So I thought, you know, why, why aren't more learning experiences really immersive and really interactive? So from day one, it just sort of this light bulb went off in my head that games were the perfect sort of missing tool in the proverbial educator's tool belt to be able to deliver more immersive hands-on experiences. Okay. And so so there, even, in the, even in the beginning, the game piece was like, it really tied to kind of, this is kind of like the education side. Like I learn well when I'm having fun type of a things in this exactly. is an immersive experience. So you knew that I think there's something to this. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I would talk about, I would talk with friends and family about the games that I played that were more on the educational game side of the spectrum, okay. like play a civilization or something like that. Where you're building an empire from the dawn of time into the. Do you have like a Do you have like a favorite tr board game that you still kind of go to? I mean, there's I I would say that there's like classics like Catan and sort of strategy games that are easy to pick up but very deep and difficult okay. to master. But honestly, I've started to dive into so many new. I have a nine-year-old, and I, we've started to we, every year that he gets older, we unlock more advanced board games, and so I've started, okay. started to dive into some more advanced content. And uh, I have to say, it's really fun challenging him. Actually, this is true of video games as well. Video games and physical board games challenging him at the edge of his ability and giving him problems to solve that are too complex, really, for his age. Okay. I think we should do this a lot more in school, by the way. Um, and uh, and just seeing watching him rise to that challenge is really, is really gratifying. Watching him struggle on his way toward okay. the challenge. Almost anyway. thinking of the zone of proximal development, kind of like know, yeah. on the cusp it's, of like, it's a little too hard, but close enough that you can challenge yourself. Yeah. Uh, it's almost, I, I almost feel like it's just past that ZPD. Like I don't want to yeah. challenge ZPD because that's like, you know, no. like the Bible at this point, <laughs> but you know, with some of his really early gaming that we did, I, I put him in games that were just like insanely too hard, like not just a little okay. bit too hard, but like insanely too hard. And obviously there was a lot of struggle. And obviously one thing that was unique about that is that I was there to scaffold him all along the way. But, um, but there was definitely value in the productive struggle. And it was struggle that took place when he was just, totally in over his head. Okay. I was pushed him in the deep end of the pool, but it wasn't. And I think this is where ZPD, what that line is for people changes also based on you were there to help scaffold it. So exactly. it's not like you're like, Here, I'm pushing you in the deep end of the pool, get pissed off and frustrated and, and flip the monopoly board, you know, like everybody has at some point in their life type of a thing. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Very difficult to do at scale, admittedly, no okay. doubt about it. You know, like okay. doing if there were like, if I had, 
If I had seven kids, <laughs> for example, it might be a little <laughs> bit more challenging. <laughs> okay. All right. I, well, I warned you I was going to jump in on these things, which, by the way, if you're watching and there is a board game, because Ethan, I saw you were like board games for the win. If you have one that you really love, comment in, would be curious on that. But let's get back to kind of your story. So you had this kind of gravitation towards, I think we can do more with games to help develop people. Yeah. So then while I was in college at Cornell, I worked at a place where we were making I'll call them digital science museums in virtual worlds. And they were okay. pretty bad. They were pretty primitive. <laughs> and yet when we were doing testing with like 4-H club, boys and girls club, middle school students, they loved it. And I was like, guys, don't love this. This is terrible. This is embarrassing. <laughs> they were here, like if it was bad and they thought it was good, that it might be awesome if, if it was actually good. Okay. Um, so that led me to go on to the University of Wisconsin and pursue a degree in education technology. Because at that point, I knew game stuff, I knew game development. I'd done some 3D work, some production. Okay, so you'd moved, you'd moved into the more technical side, which you said earlier that was not your sweet spot. Exactly. Yep. So by, by this point, I was doing actual uh, virtual, you know, digital game development, albeit with the caveat that it was pretty primitive. And, uh, and from there decided, yeah, okay, I actually need to have a learning sciences degree in order to take this to the next level, because there are a lot of really smart people who've learned a lot about human cognition. And, uh, and that's the other side of the equation here. Okay. And, and you didn't want to just be in the entertainment business. So it was more less about just getting people hooked, but how are you actually then using that for cognitive development and problem solving? Yeah, I think once I had my first taste at that at that early job where I was building the virtual science museums, that first taste of seeing what it's like when you create a game for positive impact and you have that positive impact, I was hooked. I was like, there's no way I can make a game for purely entertainment purposes at this point. Okay. Like, so once like you saw like, hey, this can be done for more than just draining my kids afternoon, like exactly. this can actually improve things. Okay. Well, so did you you, cause I just think when I hear people's career stories, sometimes you hear some of these ones and you go, you know, and I think of my own where like, I got out of school and went, I'm an educator, but I don't want to be a teacher. And right. it was like finishing med school and going, I don't want to be a doctor. And people just look at you and go, well, <laughs> that's not really a thing. So I don't really know what, to... so did you just like out of the gate be like, I guess I'm going to have to create my own company then. Or, or was that like a thing you were able to find your way into? So there was no moment where I had that exact train of thought. Okay. But, um, <laughs> after, while I was in school, I started working for an e-learning company. And the closest thought that I had to that particular thought was thinking, oh, there's no way this e-learning company is going to be able to make the jump to games. And they wanted to. Okay. They had ambitions of doing learning games because they were connected with some of the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who were okay. researching games and learning. So there was sort of an intellectual impetus for them to build instantiations of the rhetoric coming out of the university, but they just didn't, as an e-learning company, they just were nowhere close to having the, the technical or production expertise in order to make that jump. So I, I want to talk about this a little bit because this is, and, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. Actually, wait, before we go to this, let me ask this question and then I'm going to come back to it. Okay, so don't let me forget this. Although I told you I won't forget, but now I'm telling you to remind me. We've talked about kind of what you did, but how do you describe what Filament Games is? Like you bump into somebody, hey, I'm the CEO of Filament Games. And they're like, Filament Games. I mean, you can kind of, at least from the title, pick yeah. what it is. But games means a lot of things to a lot of people. So how do you describe it to people? Playful experiences that improve people's lives. That's Wow. <laughs> I like, well, you know what? There you go. There you, okay, okay. And I think as we get into this, as we show, cause we are going to show kind of an example of, of something that you've done. This isn't like we made a, a jeopardy template for storyline type of a thing. This is not right. that category of game. I mean, this is serious game development. So for those of you watching who, are, who you know, kind of want to see what this is, this is going to be a, a little deeper of a category of serious games than maybe you've seen in other things. But my question to you is this, skill set wise, because I think this is a challenge I'm seeing in the industry just in general. And you talked a little bit about the technical production skills, but I think there's, there's some UX skills that also are into mm -hmm. this. As you look at like 
traditional learning development, I, a lot of times when I look at it, it's it's more information architecture, which still is extremely valuable. It's how are we architecting information in a meaningful way and making structure out of what might be unstructured and deciding what's in, what's out. You start talking immersive, whether it's games or immersive experience. When you start dealing in human experience, it's it's a little, not a little, it's it's a big territory difference. Not that you can't make the jump, but I can see an e-learning company going like, we want to get into games, but if your whole mindset, skill set, yeah. strategy is kind of in this category and you go, yeah, well, we could do games too. It's like, no, I mean, you really would have to make either a dedicated shift in part of the company and strategy and team, or, or, or you're just going to kind of end up dabbling to some degree. Is that fair? 100%. And it's even if you set aside all the technical difficulties of making that transition, there's also a huge cultural transition. E-learning is, is in many ways antithetical to game-based learning. E-learning is like, here's the information that we need to insert into your brain. Yeah, it's cool. knowledge transfer. Yeah, it's knowledge transfer. We want to take yeah, it right. and we want to put it in like, your head. What's the least playful way we could possibly get this information into your head? And that was actually while I was at the e-learning company, I was trying to engineer little mini game-like experiences into the e-learning decks, despite the fact that you just have almost no latitude, latitude as a designer of e-learning materials to make them playful. But I pushed it as far as I could. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy to say that there were some interactions. I'll put it this way. I don't think e-learning has to be as bad as it is. There will always be a ceiling. Yeah, I agree in terms of how good it can be, but I don't think it has to be as bad as it is. No. And I think, and I think what you're getting at is a really good point. And it's something that, you know, with teams I've worked with as we've tried to move into more of the experience. I mean, honestly, there have been times with, where I've been with orgs where we've actually hired game designers because instructional design, it, the skill set divide was so big right. that it was like, no, we need people who truly are thinking about user experience in a different way. Not that you can't build it, but if you're starting from scratch, it's like we almost have to pull somebody out yeah. who just does it and then they can help upskill the rest of the group. But you can't be like, all right, well, you know, just like think in terms of experience. And I think that's that ceiling you're talking about where it's like, can we make e-learning much better than it is? Right. Yes. Are there ways we can improve it? Sure, we can do that. But you hit a point where you're like, I mean, you really want to get into the experience age. You, you got to just kind of like say, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go right. all in on this. There's only so much you can modify a bicycle. You may get an e-bike, but <laughs> still, it's never going to be a car, right? If you, want, if you want a car, you shouldn't start from a bicycle and try to improve it into a car. Right? Yeah. I, I, well, and, and I think this is one of the struggles that our industry sometimes runs into. And, and again, I have a lot of empathy for it because I've been in these roles before where you're like, like you said, similar to what you did, you're, you're trying to change it. You're trying to improve it. And at some point you're going, we're trying to make a, a mountain bike, a monster truck. And right. I mean, we just, we can put big tires on it and we can strap, but it's, it's not, let's just kind of not gonna crush any cars. <laughs> we're not going to crush any cars with this type of a thing. Okay. So, so let's talk a little bit about this because we're, we're, we're talking into this. So there's a lot of terminology that gets thrown around. There's, there's gamification, there's game based, there's serious games. How would you help kind of break that down? Cause I have no doubt that there may be times you engage with a client or you're talking to people and you're saying words and they're responding and you're like, I don't think we're speaking the same language here. Right. Okay, so game-based learning, gamification, serious games. Here's how I would define them. Serious games would be things like medical training, corporate training, military training, generally adult-oriented or professional practice-oriented experiences that are serious in nature, in some cases, literally life and death, like if you're training a doctor. Game-based learning, anything where you are creating a game that is primarily meant to teach but does not use that as an excuse to be a bad game in its own right gamification okay. is in some ways the inverse of game-based learning in that the primary objective of game-based learning is to draw on the users or the players intrinsic motivation 
game-based gamification, by contrast, is drawing on their extrinsic, extrinsic motivation. So what you're saying is, in game-based learning, you're saying, here's a challenge. Maybe you want to complete it. Maybe you don't. If you don't, that's OK. But we're counting on the fact that you do because we designed a cool and interesting challenge. Gamification, by contrast, says, OK, you've got to do this challenge. We all acknowledge that this challenge maybe is the pits. Maybe it's not fun to do at all. Maybe it's, more, maybe it's, it's your annual compliance training. It's You're going to have to do it because we have a legal requirement. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but if you do it, we're going to give you some points and some stars and some other sort of gratifying things that are going to tickle that part of your brain that generates dopamine after you complete something you get a reward. And we're going to give you scaling rewards as you complete more over time to keep you wanting to do more chores or complete more obligatory trainings. Okay. I like that. I like that because it kind of calls out the, it almost takes you back. And I think this is an important part of, because sometimes it's like, well, should we do a game? Should we not? It's like, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Right. What are you trying to accomplish with that? And if you think about game-based learning or serious games, it's like, our intention is to design a game. Like right. that's what we're trying to do. Gamification is we're trying to do something and we want to take game elements right. and incorporate into this existing thing we're trying to do in an attempt to encourage behaviors, drive accountability, like yeah. whatever that is. We're, but yeah, but meta, ultimately it's kind of a secondary thing to what we're trying to accomplish. Exactly. Like a meta structure basically built around an, a, an activity or a set of activities, you know, versus game-based learning, which is really like, how do we take a concept or a set of concepts and build play around those concepts? So those concepts could be systems, which is one of my personal favorites. Like in science, you get a lot of systems like yeah. solar systems, say solar systems. How do we build a set of game mechanics or verbs, actions that a player can take around that system in order to let them play with it? Of course, the thing that we didn't talk about is another axis, which is simulations, right? And so yeah. if you no, that's true. if you go heavy on identity or role and objectives or goals, then you're more in game territory. If you take those things away and just give somebody a system to tinker with without saying you are this role inside of this system or you have this goal inside of the system, then you're more on the simulation end of the spectrum. Okay. Okay. All right. So where would you, and then I have a follow-up question to this, like where do you see kind of situations where you go, this is where it might make sense to do this. This is where it might make sense to do more of this. Just so, and again, this, this could be a conversation in and of itself, right. but just at a high level, just to kind of help. And, and it, I will be careful and set expectations with folks that this is still very general. Like this isn't mm -hmm. just like universally always blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But are there some best practices to kind of go when you're thinking about this, this can be kind of a way to think about it that, that helps break it down. Okay. Yeah. So rote topics, things that you just want somebody to memorize, things that you just kind of have to trudge through. Those are great topics for gamification. Okay. Anything that is this sort of deep, um, really meaty learning objective or set of learning objectives that you want somebody to play with over the course of a long period of time to develop a conceptual level understanding that they can then transfer into further learning about that concept outside of the game is a great uh, time to, to bust out game-based learning. And okay. then, yeah, busting out simulation, I would say, would be when you, you want somebody you want somebody to run a bunch of different trials or experiments and see what the different outcomes are okay. in order to develop an understanding of a system. But you're not necessarily really interested in having them achieve a certain. Yeah. There, there's no like play would feel superfluous on top of your, your goals. Then a simulation is, is, a, is a great use case. Okay. Okay. So I like that. I like that on the simulation piece because that's almost kind of in a state of experimentation where it's yeah. like, I want to put you in a place where you can, you can toy, you can play with this, you can do whatever. Yeah. I'm not necessarily, which, which may be in contrast to what people may think in simulation where it's like, no, this is a clearly defined, we need you yeah. to run through this step-by-step -step instruction. 
That's yeah. the simulation. I think that's not the user has to be pretty self-motivated in, in the context of the simulation as well. Because a, a game yeah. will typically scaffold you through a set of objectives where a simulation is like, hey, I exist, pull my levers, press my buttons, turn my knobs, but like you do what you want. Uh, I'm okay. not going to necessarily give you okay. a set of instructions. So, yeah. so Ethan, Ethan asked kind of like, in some ways we're talking about exploratory where maybe, and again, I think a self-driven person may just naturally do it, or this may be a situation where you're going, we want you to explore and that's okay. It, mm -hmm. There are, there are no defined parameters. You're not going to get beat over the head if you do the wrong thing type yeah. of a thing. We just want to expose you to an environment and see what you yeah. come up with. And, and simulations, by the way, can be super fun. Like even though they're not technically games, simulations can be really fun spaces to interact with. Okay. Games can also be really boring, right? So it's not like if you're making a game, it's like I, it's gonna be. <laughs> well, and I think that's you, this kind of ties to the um, and and Gerard, I will ask your I will ask your question here, so don't worry, I will come back to this. But this gets this gets to the point that. Actually, you know what? I'm going to ask Gerard's question because then I'm going to go to this next one because um, this ties to filament games. So, so Gerard asks, you know, in terms of the games you build, the approach you take, are you more like, are you building games that then are on the shelf alongside commercial games or are you more like a boutique, like you're designing serious games specifically for organizations? Where do you fit in? Or is it both? Yeah, that's a fun question because that is changing as we speak. So historically, it was always more of the former. We would make a game that would be used in an educational or EDU context. It would be used in classrooms, after school programs, right. and learning environments. Uh, we're building a robotics game right now that is actually going to be one of our first games that will do both. It will be, and it is actually first and foremost developed to be used in a commercial, as a commercial play at home game for fun, for entertainment purposes. And okay. ironically, is probably one of the most educational experiences that we've ever made. But we're going to sell it as a straight up consumer entertainment game. Okay, which is that's the one we're going to show, right? Yeah, that's the one we're going to show. Yeah, that is which which maybe that'll. I, I, I told you we're going to bounce around a little bit because <laughs> we might go we might go to that part of the show because I do think people are kind of interested in some of these concepts, and then we're going to break down some of the stuff behind it. Um, if that makes sense, I think we might be able to kind of talk about it. Because that it ties to this question. So really, historically, you have built this for kind of purpose fit. You know, okay, we use it for this. This is how we're going to use it. Now you're saying, well, you know what? This one, and again, we talked about this because we talked about it before you joined the show. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think what you did here has enough merit to go, yeah, we can use it in this environment. But this is the yeah. kind of thing that realistically anybody should be able to have access to. And, and, and like by the that. way, we definitely still, we make a ton of games that are explicitly for classroom use or use in institutional environments. I think personally where I've arrived at is that there is a lot of great impact being done with games used in the classroom. And there is this huge untapped potential to have a really positive impact outside the classroom and sort of okay. reclaim some amount, even if it's a small amount of the time that people are spending in their free time and turning that into productive, I, I, that's not a great word because it's still fun, you know, turning that into to time that has a positive impact on their lives. And so on. Well, and I think that's the, this is where I think sometimes games can wrongly get a bad reputation as just this like useless time suck that you know, rots, rots people. And it's like, I mean, can they be? Absolutely. I mean, there, there are days of World of Warcraft that I look back sure. on and go, you know what? I could have spent, I could have spent my time way more productively yeah. than, than raiding or, or arenaing, but you know what is whatever. But I think there is a degree of, I mean, some of this can be really valuable pro and, and there's a lot of science behind this in terms of helping develop problem solving and creative thinking yeah. and some of these other things. So I think, you know, the mission to say, look, we know these are engaging. It's a powerful way to, to help develop people. Why not use it for good? Right. Um, one clarifying question that came up that I think is, is a good one. So we've been throwing around and, and mm. we do this all the time, right? We throw words around. So right. scaffolding, <laughs> let's, let's unpack what, because you talked about that, I think in terms of your son and, and yep. kind of in game development, and then we've used yep. it in a couple of, when you mean it, how are, how are you talking about that? So basically any kind of support that helps the learner get from where they are to the next level. And that could be literally me sitting next to my son saying, 
yelling at him like, no, don't hit that button, hit that button. Or like, don't do that strategy, do this strategy. Or it could be the game itself uh, telling the player, usually in a perfect world, just in time and on demand, what they need to know in order to get better at the game. So for example, in RoboCo, which is the game that we're gonna look at here in a bit, we have these robot repair tutorials. These robot repair tutorials are not full levels where you're asked to build a robot. They're levels where you're given a robot and you're asked to fix one thing that's broken about it. So we're not didactically saying, this is how you make a robot. This is how torque works. This is how gears work. We're saying, here's this is still a game space. This is still a challenge. You still have to figure it out. But we've narrowed the space as much as we possibly can to make while still making the player feel like they have a sense of agency, but can but so that they can also focus on one very particular aspect of the game, thereby learning it. So okay. scaffolding can, in games can come in all different forms, and it doesn't have to be done that way. It can also be just the game telling you, "Hey, if you want to do this, press that button. If you want to do that, yeah. um, try that strategy or whatever." So like anything that helps the player or the learner get to the next level. I mean, in many ways, I think of it, literally, I always have the picture of actual scaffolding, you know, type of a thing where like, if you tried to get on your roof, just yep. from your grunt, you'd be like, this is an Big impossible job. task. <laughs> but if you have scaffolding that slowly steps up and goes, okay, well, I climb up here and then I climb right. up here and then I climb. And suddenly this previously impossible task is broken yeah. down into meaningful steps that you go, okay, I do this and as a designer, you're being very intentional about saying, well, what is that first step and how does it layer on top and how does it layer on top? You know, it's with some intentionality. It, that's exactly it. And I've, I've never thought about this until right now, but you're right. It is real world scaffolding is the, the, the thing that the analogy is derived from. And the funny thing that makes that analogy really apt is that real world scaffolding is ugly. And scaffolding done poorly in any learning environment, games or otherwise, <laughs> is also really ugly. It's like, you don't want to look at it. You don't want it to be there any longer than it has to be. You want it to come in, get you up to the roof and get out of there. Uh, so I actually, I love that. I think that's really elegant. <laughs> yeah. And and also potentially can be dangerous if you don't know it right. right. <laughs> that's also <laughs> Which in some it. ways it can. I mean, if you, if you, and I think that's where the intentionality behind scaffolding is actually really important because if you do it wrong, yeah. It actually can be detrimental to what you're trying to accomplish. Totally. And if you do are. not be intentional, and it happens all the time, which we'll get to. For sure. And people also don't want to feel like they are being scaffolded. They still want to feel no. like they're getting up to the top of the roof by themselves. <laughs> but they but but they but they can't. So it's like that that catch 22 of like I have to help you, but I have to make you feel like But I have to do it in a way that doesn't feel like it's yes. And again, I think this is the challenge we run into as learning designers and doing this well versus just doing it are two very different things because yeah. everybody is different in terms of like, well, what's their definition of like, get off my back. I know what I'm doing. Right. That's different. And what feels like a good scaffold to one person may feel like, well, this is still an impossible task type of a thing. I think this continues to be the challenge we run into. 100%. Um, uh, one other more technical just question, then we'll, then we'll talk a little bit about the sure. robotics game is, so Amy asked about simulations, including feedback. So even in this kind of exploratory environment of simulations, and I think the answer, we answered it a little bit, but just to clarify, there still is um, feedback involved. We're not saying like they just go do things and they have no idea whether it does something. There's still feedback that kind of lets them know was this a good decision, a bad decision? What are the implications of this decision type of a thing? It's just not a, you made the right or wrong decision for the desired path that we want. It's more like, well, here's what happens. I would say that feedback is a slider that can be set to low or high or anywhere in between for actually any of those different categories that we talked about. It's true for simulations, it's true for game-based learning, it's true for gamification whether or not you have a lot of, I would say in general, games tend to give users more feedback. And actually this is something that gamification does really well is they give you a ton of feedback because that's part of what gives you those dopamine cycle. It gets you in those dopamine hit cycles. So simulations historically tend to be a little bit lighter on the feedback side, but there's no reason from a, like a straight up genre definition perspective that they have to be light on feedback. 
Yeah. Be okay. Gonna be ton, tons of yeah. Well, I mean, I just even think as an example, like if you're exploratory, you know, exploring things and you hit a red button, like yeah. it can sound an alarm type and you're like, oh, okay, right. well, that's, you know, type of a thing. So there is a level of feedback. It's just less punitive or yeah. things like that. Well, and oftentimes I think designers of simulations consider the output of the simulation itself to be the feedback as opposed to having explicit meta level, like, hey, you just did this. This is the result that you got. Uh, you know, that result was, or like, you know, classifying that result on a spectrum of good to bad. Whereas games yeah. and gamification, I think are more prone to, okay. to actually explicitly creating that metadata uh, around your interactions and your inputs. Okay. By the way, everybody watching, listen, I love all the questions coming in. Uh, this is one of those. I, it's always interesting for me to watch and listen to the show as I'm hosting these because certain topics, people get very curious. They have lots of questions. Other ones, they're more just kind of like soaking it in. So uh, appreciate the question. We'll continue to incorporate those. So let's talk about this robotics one because Gerard, to your question of our games for a business environment, my, my answer to that is it depends because it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I, I would say, yes, you just need to, how are you thinking about it? But I think as we get into some of these, you're going to start to see how it's less of a copy paste and more of a, oh, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Here's how we approached it. Now, how could that translate to a business environment where you're maybe trying to solve a similar problem, which I have a good example that we were talking about backstage with Pepsi um, you know, type of thing. But let's talk about this robotics game that is going to cross this line between kind of yeah. direct boutique and now going kind of commercial. Yeah. So what's the, what's the Genesis history of this? And we'll actually talk and show it a little bit here too. Yeah. So the, the Genesis is basically this idea that robotics as a topic is this like superfood for 21st century skills designing robots to solve problems and then, you know, coding them in some cases, there's design thinking, there's problem solving, there's teamwork if you're, if you're doing it collaboratively with other players. So there's just so many great soft and hard skills that are what some people refer to as future facing skills or skills that are highly relevant for today's workforce and success outside of school in, in modern society. So that's why I love robots as robots as a topic to begin with. The okay. challenge is that robotics is really expensive. Like physical robotics is really expensive. <laughs> it's extreme. Getting the kids, right? I've looked into some of these, like for, I mean, as my kids are getting older, where it's like, oh, you can get into these robotics clubs and you can do some, and it's not cheap. Yeah, it's it, it's yeah. not cheap. And talking about scaffolding, there's often very little scaffolding for robotics as well. So I know. It's like, here, build a robot. Yeah, like, here's, here's like this huge, get, yeah. <laughs> And here's your motor to begin. You're like, what? I don't even know how to write a line of code, or I can, I can, I can turn a screwdriver. I know how to do that, but that's about it. So, um, so the time, take the expense out of the equation, which is a huge factor, and just sit, and just look at how long it takes the average person starting out with no knowledge of robotics to get into their first big win that gets them excited about robotics and sticking with it, and excited, I would say, about STEM at large. So. We basically said there should be a really good digital robotics application because we can solve both of those problems. We can solve the cost problem and we can also make it, we can also shallow out that learning curve and make it so that the player gets to a point where they have a success and think of themselves as being someone who is efficacious in the field of robotics in a very short okay. period of time. So Roboco was born. Roboco is basically a game where just like in physical robotics, we give you a problem to solve. Maybe you have to build a robot that can deliver a sandwich in a cafe or cross a gap to turn off a valve or compete in a dance competition, whatever it is. They're usually like fun, zany challenges. You okay. have to build from scratch a robot that can solve those objectives. So you can kind of think of it like Lego on crack, right? So like you have all the agency <laughs> of building <laughs> Lego. But like you have gears and pistons and motors and servos. Well, and you're doing it to solve a problem, not just be like, hey, isn't it cool yeah, to build it? Because that's, I mean, I will tell you, and then I want to get back to this. This is one of the challenges that I've run into personally with my kids with robotics because I bought them some robotics kits. Yeah. But to your point of the barrier to entry is usually very high. It's usually not problem-based. Yeah. You know, you end up getting a kit and it's like, follow the instructions. Yeah. So like, okay, I can learn how to assemble and put it together. Right. 
but I didn't necessarily learn the principles behind it. I didn't really get to experiment or play because they don't send you like, here's a bucket of Lego that just like build what, cause if they did, if they just said, here's a bunch of robotics parts, right, right, your right. kid would just be like, um, what? yeah. So yeah, that's I don't really know. And then on the other end of the spectrum, following instructions step-by-step step is a drag, right? So it's like, it's so boring. Either way you go, <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Okay. So you designed to solve that problem with this. That's exactly right. And there, there's a host of other, uh, things, there's a host of other reasons why digital robotics is advantageous, but I would never, I always like to caveat that I would never like to, I would never advocate for digital robotics replacing physical robotics. Huh. I think of them as basically two flavors that go really well together, right? So like the digital solution does certain things really, really well, like without any expense associated with the parts, you can build things that you would never be able to build in the real world. On the other hand, with physical robotics, so we're partnered with an organization called First Robotics on this, and they do physical competitions that are sort of like robotics as sport. So think like football or soccer, but robotics. Oh, it's sport. very competitive. Super competitive. <laughs> like the, the tournaments, the physical tournaments that they host are incredible. And the things, the skills that the students learn building robots to compete in those tournaments, I mean, that that knowledge is absolutely irreplaceable. They're, there are, there's no way that we could replace that with digital and we are doing digital robotics competitions as well, but it's a very different thing than physical one. Well, and thing, your point on this one, your point on this about they're not in competition. They really mm -hmm. are an augmentation yes, to each exactly. other. And I think we run into this sometimes with the whole digital physical space where like yeah. people are like, which one are you on? And it's right, like, which side are you why on? are yeah. we arguing? Which, yes. why are we arguing? It's, it's both and. Because I even just think with robot, like there's something about picking up a moat and recognizing like this thing's moving it. Like there, there are elements of that you're not going to get as you're playing with a digital motor. It's just yes. not the same, but it's not bad or less than it's like, it's just different. Exactly. It's different strengths and weaknesses. Another, another weakness of digital, for example, well, that could be a strength is that we can never, going back to our simulations conversation, we can never create a perfect recreation of world, real world physics in a digital space, right? Right. But at the same time, you could also turn that on its head and use it as a learning opportunity and say like, okay, students investigate what about this physics space is different than how things would actually respond in the real world. Well, I think it also allows you to push yourself outside the bounds sometimes. And this is one of the things I love about VR where you're like, well, play outside the lines of what you could do because yeah. those rules don't exist. And in some ways it stretches your creativity in ways that you can't because you're like, well, I, I, I can't do that. And it's like, Totally. You couldn't, but you can here. So what if you could do that? Yeah. Yep. No, that's exactly right. So yep. Two, two great flavors that go great together. And so I think we're just really excited about what it looks like to have students bouncing back and forth between the two different experiences. What does it look <laughs> like when somebody competes in a digital competition? What are the affordances there? Can we get more people involved? That's the ultimate you know, the, the, let's the, just say accessibility. You're accessibility. opening the doors to people that before financially or just exactly. whatever or would not have access. In a rural area, and you don't have a club in your area, or you'd have to commute an hour to go participate in your your closest club. All of these things are factors. Or the physical competitions. As cool, it's really cool that they're they're in person. But the downside of that is that students have to fly from all over the world in some cases, which is another expense on top of the physical hardware that they have to purchase. Well, so. or even, I just even think of things. And, and again, I think this is one of those where they're not in competition. It's more of, well, what possibilities can we achieve that we yeah. couldn't have historically done before? Because I even think about some of those things. It's right. like, well, what if you're planning to go to this, you suddenly get sick or you break your leg and you go, well, right. now the, I missed the one opportunity I had. It's like, well, now you're removing that barrier. Not again to say, oh, let's cancel all of these. No, that's not it. It's how do we create greater opportunity for folks? It extends to the challenge design too, because the the challenges that are designed for the physical world necessarily are limited by the affordances of the physical world. In the digital space, we can create a scenario where you have to build the Mars rover. You know, we can put you on Mars, we can create the physics of Mars, we can create scenarios underwater, things that would be absolutely impractical. Impossible. Yeah, absolutely impossible, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, and I think going back to one of the questions of, could you do this in a business environment? The answer is 
these types of things we're talking about here where Ethan, yes, the joke of, yeah, we're kind of talking about the plot of the matrix here. I mean, in some ways we are, but, but this is kind of the world we're playing in where the rules of what we know, we can kind of say, Hey, if we're trying to solve these problems in creative ways that we just are struggling to get past, how can we use technology and games to actually create an environment where we go, I mean, maybe we can solve this and maybe you get a solution that you go, well, we can't exactly translate that back. But now you can say, well, OK, but what if we deconstruct that and go, what parts can't work? Now, how do we re-engineer it to work? Because we designed a solution in an environment that we couldn't have done before. That's right. Yeah, exactly. OK, so do you want to should we pull it up just so people yeah. can kind of see? Yeah, what so I, I know I'm a very visual person, so I hate it when people talk about things that I can't see. So that's well, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes people ask that they're like, you talk about all these like yeah. really <laughs> ethereal kind. You're like, okay, robotics game, and like, oh, and then you're like, I don't. What are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Exactly. Let me just hit play. So this is Roboco, right? Yeah. So what you're seeing right now is actually one of the first comp digital competitions that we tried where we had MCs, you know, sort of ESPN sports style. Uh, it's so cool. The different countries from all around the world competing, building different types of robots. Uh, this one's just created for fun. It's not a particularly useful robot, but it's an Ankylosaurus. How cool is that? There's somebody coming up with an interesting piston design for delivering a sandwich. Here's a, another design for delivering a cup of coffee. So basically, like, a, a good way to think of this is kind of like gamified CAD, right? So, like, yeah, not quite as powerful. Computer-aided drafting, for those who may not. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. it's basically like if you, were, if you were to, like, simplify CAD a little bit, but still have it be powerful enough to give you the creative agency to create essentially anything that you could possibly imagine. So you see some people make things that are, there's also a sandbox space where you can just sort of freeform create, but here's a challenge, you know, so we, we create quirky challenges. This is the saw log challenge that was also involved in the, in the competition where you had to uh, branch, take the branches off, then bring the log without touching down, without touching the ground and then load several logs into the back of a truck. So a lot of these challenges are like multi-stage or multi multi-faceted where Okay. Maybe one so the teams board. are being presented with a challenge. They're given the resources to build this, and then they have to actually engineer their own robot to solve the problem. Exactly. From scratch. Yep. So you've got, yeah, blocks, pistons, motors, gears. Um, the scoring is, so there are more elegant solutions and less elegant solutions. So we score based on the cost of your robot. Some parts okay. cost more and some parts are, are more efficient. Um, there's also the human element and we're actually in the process of designing some uh, challenges that would require so there's also a, a programming and we're designing some challenges that would require you to have hybrid intelligence robots so robots that are working alongside people and that are okay. partially manually controlled and that are partially uh controlled through manually through RC controllers and partially through automation you script and okay data. um so we're really interested or in even what, even in that sense you're kind of to some degree talking about how you're teaching people even how to start working with ai and automation to it right because right. it's like here's how you're working with there's a human side to this but then also there's a automation you need to understand how you're working with exactly. with ai and and machines exactly yep so th this video in particular was just a collection of different robots that people have made that we put strung together into one video. It doesn't show the actual challenges quite as much, but, okay. um, but yeah, basically the challenges are, there will be a main objective and then there'll be multiple sub objectives. And what we, what we find is that the vast majority of people who play are really, really set on getting it perfect. And I love this because you just don't see that mentality very often in, in school, right? It's like, how can I, like get a decent like what's the minimum amount of work that i can do to get a decent grade whereas like yeah. time and time again we see people play this game and they're like oh i built something it did okay but it wasn't perfect so i'm going to iterate on my design i'm going to keep iterating until i nail it well and and so again i just think of some of these things because one of the things we wanted to talk oh so so tactical question that ethan brought up so this is there's the physical building of the robot but is there also then a programming side of this where it's they actually have to program the bots yep so starting out in the game you're just using manual you wire up the the robot to rc controllers and control it manually to solve the objectives 
uh, as you get more advanced in the game, you have the ability to create uh, um, draft Python scripts to run your robot. And there are a bunch of different parts that are sensors. So we have a color sensor, proximity sensor, um, depth sensor, um, uh, think things of that nature that would allow you to take inputs in from the robot okay. and respond in certain ways based on your script. Okay. So you're actually then taking all, and again, this goes back to our scaffolding conversation before of, instead of just throwing all of this at somebody going, you got to learn to code Python scripts. You got to learn how to do all these sensor inputs and you got to learn how to build a robot. It's like, no, let's get you started with. And I think you even said in the beginning, it's like, here's a partially made robot that you start to just modify and start to experiment and play with like, well, what happens when you change these things around and then you're just yeah. layering up as you build that skill. Yep. That's right. Yep. And as you saw in that clip too, it's also just a legitimate creativity tool in and of itself. Some people just, especially now that there's a coloring system, some people just make things for fun and beauty. <laughs> <laughs> even art. If no You're just making art robots. For art. Yeah. Even if it has no functional purpose. So I do, I talk about STEM a lot when I talk about RoboCode, but I really should be saying STEAM because uh, it is also legitimately a, a mode for creating art as well. So, so here's one of the things that I think about just from an application on, because I think there's so many things we talked about that, that cross boundary lines where you're like, well, but yeah, that's great. That's for kids. And it's like mm -hmm. adults are we're just big kids in many regards. I think sometimes we forget this where it's like, oh no, but like, it's not like you turn 18 and suddenly you're like boring and you go, you know what? All those, those sides of you that you enjoyed, you know what? That you just, you grew out of that. It's like, yeah. those are still there. And yeah. I think there is lots of opportunity for us to think about this. So, so there's that element of it. But I think one of the other things we talked about before we went live is the fact that this next generation is going to have a very different educational upbringing than we did. I mean, and I and I probably was like right on that borderline where it was like, well, I kind of had some of this stuff, not, you know, I kind of crossed both lines. But this next generation, this is kind of like the norm and the expectation that we need to start thinking about and learning. I think as particularly for younger generations, as the level of interactivity and level of sophistication of the interactive experiences that they engage with for entertainment purposes, as that becomes further and further disparate, and there's a bigger and bigger gulf between those types of experiences and what they experience in formal learning environments, there's going to be more disengagement, more dissatisfaction, right, with what's going on. Okay. Because, yeah. you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, if you have, uh, if you have somebody who's you know, on a day-to-day -day basis using really advanced technology and then you put them in a different context and you say, start a fire with this, with these two sticks and rock, Stick. you know, <laughs> then they're going to be like, well, why wouldn't I just use my nuclear powered flamethrower? That I can <laughs> you know? so. We see this though. We see that you see this though in the talent market. And I think what we talked about going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation of the flexibility that you provided filament games for folks, yeah. it's a similar type situation where people if they've experienced a degree of flexibility in their in their life and in their professional life, and then they go to a company and it's like, wait a minute, you want me to be here at this time and sit in my chair until the, for right. what purpose? And it's like, right. well, the, that's just what we expect. And and they go, nah, nah right. I'm, I, I'm not going to do that type of a thing. And I think that's something that's coming for our industry where we've kind of been in this weird space where it was like, well, it just kind of is what it is. And, and that's how we have to be. And it's like, well, we're going to hit a point where eventually people are going to go, I don't accept this anymore. This is just, this is now a deterrent, not just a nuisance. Yes. I think you, you hit the hammer, hit the, hit the hammer on the head. <laughs> yeah, the hammer. That's how it works. Right. Yeah. yeah. When, when you said for what purpose, because that is, I feel like, since since the dawn of time, that's that is the sort of instinct that people have in learning environments, uh, because they're exchanging their time ostensibly for some kind of value that's going to help them outside of that environment. And if there's not an obvious connection between what they're doing there and and why it matters outside of that environment, it's only natural that the brain disengages. Right? It's like I'm going yeah. to spend my limited and precious focus ability on the things that are going to matter when I leave this space. 
And so that's why I think that question always has to be at the top of people's minds. Well, and I and I just think about it. I posted about it last week where, you know, a lot of times in our industry, we see a lot of reports come out where people say, well, I don't have time for learning. I don't have time to engage in these types of things. And that's a lot of times taken at the surface level. And this is a question I, I knew we were going to run out of time, but right, that, that it's taken as like, oh yeah, see, they just, they need smaller, bite size, faster type. And it's like, maybe... Or maybe not, maybe that's an indicator that what they're saying is what you're offering is not worthwhile enough for me right. in the time that I spend. If I were to look at all the things that I have to do, I look at what this is and I say, that's not adding enough value for me to push something out of the way to commit exactly. to that. Exactly. And that's ultimate. That is another big reason why we ultimately decided first and foremost, we're going, we're targeting consumer at home because these experiences are so long form. They're so like you, you would still be considered a RoboCo novice after plugging six hours into this game. Right. And for a lot of educators, that's like an entire week worth of classes. That's more. Yeah. Than That'd be their whole week. That'd be their entire week. Right. And so, you know, when I think about some of my most profound learning experiences, they're, 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 Things that happened, the things that occurred on a longitudinal basis that I engaged with and re-engaged with and iterated on and got better and better and better at and went deeper and deeper and deeper on. And that is the beauty of games as a technology is that they afford those kind of long form possibility spaces with big, rich problems to solve. And, the, and, and it just, it frustrates me to no end that it's so hard to fit that type of experience yeah. in the box into the, the the round hole that is the classroom in many cases I, I think it would be amazing to have a game like this in the classroom i just from a from a from a practicalities uh, and i think that's one of the challenges we deal with on the corporate side which is why i think we need to be thinking about consumer grade experiences yeah as kind of our front runner where we go, listen, we need to recognize, because again, we deal with this in the corporate space where similar to like you said, well, okay, yeah, we'd love to have teachers have their kids do that, but that'd be their week. They do nothing but even play this video game from the moment they got into class and left for a week. Similar to work. It's like people are like, I have a job to do. I mean, I know you would love to have me engaging in professional development all day long. And I may even want to do some of that, but I also have a job that has to get done. And I think right. that's one of those. So how do we recognize that barrier and say, how can we be designing experiences that people find value in actually engaging in, in and outside of the traditional walls of where they normally would engage with it? This is, this is why I love project-based learning because I feel like project-based learning is a template for answering that question in formal learning environments, right? And and I think the best way to think about long form games like this is to think of them as projects that you would implement into a project-based learning style classroom, because that's probably the most logical way to, to implement something like that. Yeah. Well, and I think this is, again, it's an augmentate, it's not a, so do we do away with classroom and, and you know, corporate, no. Right. It's how do we augment them with this consumer style type stuff that people go, oh, here's where I here's where I supersede and develop some of these things. Because the other thing that I just think as I look at Roboco, mm -hmm. and I just think from my own personal experience recently of picking up skateboarding with my kids, mm -hmm. you don't build skills yeah. in like 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's or not like, can I just do this right? thing and then become a master at robotics? Yeah. Or, a, you know, can I do a 180 kickflip off, you know, yeah. it, like, no, you can't. I, it doesn't matter what kind of experience we put you in. You are not going to figure this kind of stuff out in an afternoon. And I think recognizing that skills aren't built overnight. So we right. have to think bigger than this. Exactly. And, and that's where I do see a role for schools in, sending giving people that sort of gateway drug if you will but in a positive uh, conversation <laughs> to then go off on their own volition and pursue something so right like this is kind of what gym class does it's an interesting model right where we say nobody in here is going to get great at any particular sport we're going to try a bunch of different sports across the year and then if you want to go play football at, and you want to join the football team or whatever because that really uh tripped your trigger then great so i could totally see a similar model for experiences like RoboCo where it's like, let's, let's take a classroom or two and play the first couple of levels. And then if people want to keep playing 
on their own. Right. Business. And then we give them access to it. And I think program. that's where this, this line of like traditional education, consumer education, corporate education, yeah. it's like, we need to kind of stop drawing these dividing lines because yeah. It is that, I, and I love the gym analogy. It's like, let's give people exposure to things, yeah. show them the pathway, go, here's the tools to do it. People will do it. People want to grow and develop if they feel it's relevant and they have access to the resources to help them. Totally, totally. Yeah, we should never underestimate the power of the inspiration that is can be the result of exposing somebody to the right thing, exposing a particular brain to the thing that lights that brain up. And then knowing that they'll do most That's of the it. work on their own once they're, yeah. once they're fired up about something. Yeah. Well, I, I, I knew we were going to run out of time, but this was a fascinating, extremely fun discussion. So fortunately, you know, hopefully for everyone at home or in the office, wherever you happen to be sitting right now, um, you got as much out of this as I did. I really appreciate your time, Dan. This was a, a very fun uh, conversation. And I no doubt will be keeping an eye out for the game anyway, just for my own kids um, type of a thing. So thanks for joining me and talking about this. And again, for all you watching and listening, if you've, if you've kind of dismissed game-based learning or, or anything related to games in the corporate sector, for whatever reason, I would, I would strongly encourage you to think again, just think carefully, do it wisely. So thank you for your time, Dan. Thanks for being here. And thanks everybody for watching. Thanks so much.